Hello everyone, this is going to be a video where I talk about ice. So this was motivated, I'll be honest, by seeing a lot of newer players doing stuff that I thought was sort of suboptimal, and this is not really meant as a sub a subtweet, but more as like a trying to maybe get the way I think about ice a little bit more, and hopefully I think it's at least a useful frame to start thinking about ice. I can't claim to be a fantastic deck builder or player, I think I'm you know, decent enough. And hopefully you can think about these. Uh, this will help you think about ice and how you win this the corp in a little bit of a different way than you might if you're coming out of just gateway. So what does ice do uh, is sort of like the the fundamental, one of the fundamental questions in Netrunner, right? Um, I think actually one of the first reasons I wanted to make this video was someone in my uh, Twitch stream chat was like, but just don't run ice. like. It's, it's better to not run ice than to run ice if you can. And I, I disagreed, but like didn't feel like I had a great explanation as to why. So this video is, to, is also meant as an essay on sort of that. And ice, interestingly, like the first way people often think about it is describing it as a tool that stops the runner from getting in. The game is sort of designed so that the runner can get in. One of the ideas that is sort of created in Gateway, and almost every Netrunner intro product has been that ICE is there to stop the runner from actually getting into the server. But sort of an inherent tension in the design of Netrunner is in fact actually the runner is supposed to be able to break ICE, and there's a lot of cost to the court for just stacking ICE infinitely, and so instead there's other things that you typically do to actually win the game as the court. So ICE isn't the way you win the game, it's instead, it's a tool used to control the flow of the game. If you're a fast deck, you use a particular type and style of ice. If you're a slower or a mid-range deck, all of those provide different ice to, or there's different ice in the card pool that optimizes the, uh, having you control the flow of the game exactly the way you want it. So ice is typically a defensive tool. It's there's not many ice that are offensive, though we are starting to see a couple of Nisei cards that are, I would say, ex towing that line and, and trying out a little bit. And there are very few decks, as I've been saying, where ice is actually the only thing that's winning you the game. If you go to something like Always Be Running and click around in decks, a lot of decks will have a mix of ice and upgrades and assets, and they will talk about how the assets help them win the game in a lot of meaningful senses. The big sort of exceptions lately have been sort of Acme decks, which leverage the ID and some particular ice uh, that synergize very well with the Acme ID. But even something like Precision Design, which is a pretty ice-focused and ice-central list, doesn't really rely just on its ice. Instead, uses its ice and upgrades as sort of a multiplier for each other. So there's a bunch of different types of ice, and when I talk about control of the flow of the game, each of these different types have a different function on how they control the flow of the game. And the first type of ice is gear check ice, and I've just pulled up uh, sort of three quintessential examples of gear checks ice. You have vanilla, which is a barrier that ends the run, enigma, a code gate that ends the run, and sentry, and guard, a sentry that ends the run. And all three of these, like, they just force the runner to have a breaker or some other tool to handle the ice, uh, more or less. And they're all relatively cheap to res. There's probably better examples of a low strength uh, gear check sentry, but there's actually not a ton. And there's, there's some sort of inbuilt systemic reasons that sentries tend to be a bit more expensive per cost uh, than other things, but I'm not going to delve into that too much in detail here. So this is one type of ice, but you also have other types of ice that you can look at. And one of the next ones is taxing. So these ice don't always end the end the run. They often instead say there's a, a large cost for the runner to go through this piece of ice. And they tend to be more in this middle three to four, five, six credit kind of resing range. Very few taxing ice, AKA, ice that's going to cost the runner a lot of money to go through or to just kind of tank all the subroutines is going to be very cheap. And generally gear ice that's very expensive tends to stop the run in some fashion. Taxing barriers are also pretty uncommon. So Eli was sort of one of the main ones I want to go to. Gold Farmer 
is a another example of a taxing barrier, but it was so taxing it in fact got banned. Uh, Mausolus and F2P are good examples of code gates and sentries where they don't have hard in the run, so runners will occasionally tank these subroutines or with F2P like pseudo tank them by paying the two credits. Um, but they're still impactful pieces of ice when the subroutines do fire and they're quite expensive for the runner to break with most breakers. And so finally, the other main way you think about ice is how much damage it does when the runner face checks it. So I grabbed all sentries here, and that's sort of um, in part because of how sentries are designed, where their subroutines tend to be the most wild and the least sort of related to just the specific run. Like barriers basically always end the run. Code gates usually do something a little bit weird, and then sentries really go and attack the runner. There are other types of punishing kind of ice, and I generally think of it about face checking. When the runner runs into this and they don't have their breaker installed, these cards tend to do the most work they can they can do. So you have cards like Drafter in HB and Nancy in Jinteki, Trebuchet in Wayland, and there's, you know, you can think about that Wayland's got some exam or sorry, NBN has some examples as well. But the primary goal of these, these cards are variably efficient at ending the run or taxing or things like that. But what they generally will do is go and really wreck the runner who comes into them unprepared. And so you generally end up balancing between all, all of these different things when you're thinking about ice. So most ice is on this spectrum. It's some check of taxing, punishing, and gear checking. So we can think about ping, which is sort of a punishing to face check and also sort of a gear check ice it just says if you have a barrier breaker out i'm a trivial to break but when you first encounter me it's going to be quite taxing afshar is an interesting kind of um taxing and gear check piece of ice where it doesn't punish that much it does actually punish a reasonable amount the runner losing two credits is not nothing um but the runner is going to struggle to ever break afshar for less than three credits um, and then Suzana no Mikoto is sort of a gear check uh, taxing because it's just because it's so high strength of a sentry. There's probably better examples, but this was like the one of the ones that came to my mind in the sentry set. Um, just as a quick thing, I haven't mentioned tech ice, um, and tech ice is actually quite important but a little bit harder to classify because it's inherently a response to the runner meta so some stuff like ip block will have extra effect if there's ais in the meta tithe ended up being a tech ice during the apocalypse meta where you didn't have other sentries you wanted to play but tithe meant that um the apocalypse anarchs would have to install their mk ultra or risk losing their apocalypses from hand and so even though Tithe, you could argue, is like a, a slightly taxing century, like it's an example of a very cheap taxing piece of ice, um, it was really there to sort of force the runner to spend a lot more credits than you were. And then you have stuff like Magnet, which is there to, you know, basically hose, well, in modern era, Botulus, but like in theory, was also printed to beat Parasite and things like that. So... When you evaluate the strength of ice, there's really actually two things you're looking at, which is the res cost and the strength. The number of subroutines is relevant, but the actual text on the subroutines almost doesn't matter for virtually every piece of ice that you're evaluating. And this might seem a little bit weird. That means actually a lot of the text on ice is not terribly interesting. Uh, and this is, I would guess, part of the reason the Netrunner designers are saying they're looking to depower ICE generally, because ultimately ICE is to some extent just a mathematical engine that keeps the game kind of flowing, and making the ICE super impactful is, is not the most um, compelling part of the game for many of, for at least some subset of the player base. As an example of this, I'm going to go back to some really old cards. So Eli 1.0 and Marcus 1.0. Eli, when it came out, immediately took over the meta. Uh, it was a one influence, three cost, four strength barrier. At the time, people were playing Corroder, and so it always cost two clicks or four credits to break Eli. You know, rigs could always change that a little bit, but it was that's that was a very good rate of return. 
most ice costs less to break the first time than it costs the corp to res. Eli breaks that, and it's a really nice high strength barrier. I remember when Marcus 1.0 was spoiled, a lot of us, myself, who was not a very good player at the time, thought that this would be a commonly seen piece of ice because its first subroutine is so much worse than Eli's and it has two subroutines just like Eli 1.0. Now it's one more credit and it's one lower strength, but surely the stronger subroutine makes up for some strength. Marcus 1.0 saw about no play the week like two weeks after the pack came out because everyone had the experience where they put in their decks for the first week and discovered that it just wasn't really relevant at all that it had that first subroutine. Now, um, this is not universally true. This is a particularly egregious case because both of these are biroids, so Marcus 1.0 can just have its worst subroutine click through. But generally when evaluating ice, you don't want to think about what if I fire it, but you want to think about what is the cost for the runner to break this? Because that is really the primary axis, not the power of the subroutine once it's fired. So as I sort of alluded to, and if you play a lot of standard, you're going to end up seeing the same ice over and over and over again. There's many more printed pieces of ice than ice that gets played in standard. I would say probably about 60% of ice doesn't really get major play in tournaments, and it's a really small minority of ice that gets seen in a lot of different decks. Um, and the reason is basically ice is on a power curve. Every card in, I think, basically every card game is on some kind of power curve. And you have the theoretical power curve for ice that is basically relating their res cost to their break cost. Face checking, punishing ice tends to be more expensive for its uh, cost and generally a little bit cheaper on the break side, but the idea is it gets a bigger swing when it, when it lands. Gear check ice that people tend to play in their decks is almost universally very low res cost because the goal is just to make the runner spend the time to get their breaker out. And then taxing ice ends up following the middle. And there is, if you sit down and look at NRDB, some idea of like, oh, if this, if my ice costs, you know, barriers will have somewhere around a one credit is uh, one strength or subroutine. And so, you know, that's sort of the curve for that. Code gates will have a slightly different cost to uh, cost to res to cost to break ratio and centuries will have another one. And so what ends up happening is the stuff that's above curve or can be above curve in situations of the deck crafts ends up being seen in a lot of decks. The other way that ice gets seen is when it's tech ice, like I mentioned earlier, where it can serve multiple roles. So I'm going to very quickly, and like this is not meant to be exhaustive, but go over common barriers. And so the three most common barriers you will see in standard and actually almost the only barriers you will see in standard are vanilla, IP block, and border control. Now, why do I say these are basically the only barriers you're gonna see in standard? Well, because of paperclip. Paperclip at three influence is a barrier that recurs itself from the heap. And also that, mean, that means that you don't actually have to spend a click to install it. You can instead spend that click to draw a card. So this goes in basically every runner deck. And then the way it breaks ice is super advantageous for Paperclip, where all of these different barriers, which have four strength, get broken for three credits. Even though they cost wildly different amounts for the corp to res uh, and have different sub numbers of subroutines, two, two, one, two, blockchain could in theory have more than two, so it might technically cost Paperclip an extra credit or two. But you're spending very wildly different amounts of money to end up having the runner always pay the same amount. And so paperclip just is an immense flattening of the barrier design space. And so, you know, if you run a four or a five or a six strength barrier, they often are costing two more credits. Like it costs often two more credits to go up each point of strength. And it's not costing the runner two more credits to go up each point of strength. And so it doesn't quite make sense to run these high strength, high res cost barriers. So you will see IP block because it is the cheapest four strength barrier. You'll occasionally see Eli, though not very often. But what you'll see a lot of people run is just say vanilla and border control because vanilla 
saying, oh, I'm going to spend the click, and the Wonderland has to spend four credits to install their paperclip and one credit to break the vanilla. That's a decent trade still. And then Border Control has some extra utility because you can trash it to end the run. And so those are most of the two barriers you'll see. I'm not mentioning Hagen and Bran here. Those are HB, and we'll see some play. And the, like, there's gonna, always going to be exceptions, but Paperclip is really massively warping the design space for barriers and the strength and res space for barriers. And so that's why you're going to see a lot more vanilla and border control than you're going to see Hakarls and Elis. Common code gates, there's actually a ton of these. And I think this is one of the really interesting things. Um, code gates, almost every faction has their own set of code gates they run because most code gates are in the two to three um, influence range and sort of, w they end up kind of fitting with the theme of a faction in a way that they often don't make quite as much sense to import across factions. It's not universally true. You'll see Mausolus and Afshar and Magnet splash around places, but you get a lot of variety in code gates and it's, they tend to be very faction flavored. So this is a subset, there's even more. Um, I also put Enigma in the upper right hand corner because it ends up fulfilling a really important role for a bunch of rush decks where it actually forces the runner to go install their code gate breaker. A lot of these other cards do or don't really encourage the runner like don't quite always hard require that we're going to install their code gate breaker or if they do they're actually relatively expensive and so enigma hits this nice range where it will be punishing if the runner face checks it costs them about a click which basically makes enigma very efficient for its res cost and then if they do have uh, a code gate breaker it's not a huge investment to actually go and rest it as the corp and then for centuries it's interesting because just like code gates, there's not a universal breaker. Now, Bugalter, I'm not putting up on screen and not mentioning, is sort of like de facto the best killer I probably ever printed. Um, and in theory, that should homogenize the space a lot, but it's not like everyone's running Bugalter. Like we see a lot of MK Ultra um, and other like shapers will run Ika, things like that. Um, but what ends up tending to happen is that all centuries sort of end up falling on the on a pretty linear cost curve. And so you end up taking the one that's just a little bit above that cost curve because paying one fewer or one more credit doesn't give you a one more, like it. it's very kind of spiky where there's a couple of ice in each faction that really kind of violate the normal curve and you know, so you end up with stuff like a Nazi, Ansel, Hydra, that are the most, I mean, actually Hydra is not the most commonly run sentry. Turnpike is the most commonly run sentry, um, but that's due to the type of decks that NBNs tend to run and isn't uh, as nice of an example for this demonstration. Um, and there's some other common sentries that I'm not mentioning as well, like uh, HB will run Drafter, um, but a lot of the centuries that we'll see a lot of play that people think of like, oh, this is big and scary. Like there's a best big and scary in faction and then the fall off is pretty steep. Uh, and then if you don't see this, you go to the cheap in faction century, which are like your turnpikes, your drafters. Um, and I guess now in Jinteki, your anemones. So earlier in the video, I talked about why is an ice on its own a win condition? And there's sort of some fundamental, like, it doesn't have to be this way, but it is, seems, it is the way that the game is currently designed. Where ice, the first time you res it, usually costs more for you to res than it co costs the runner to break. And then ice also requires more investment from the corp. So as the corp, you have fewer clicks than the runner. And you have to install more pieces of ice, investing more clicks. And the runner actually gets a lot of efficiency out of that. Every barrier you put down after the first one doesn't require the runner to find a new barrier breaker. It just requires them to make money, which is a thing that basically every runner deck is always designed to do and do in a very efficient manner, or at least the best runner decks are. To have ice be your win condition, you need to actually invest a ton of money in resing the ice, installing the ice, and then clicks, which is time in, in, in getting that ice on the board. And so often, just because of how runner economies work, how that 
uh, one breaker beating many ice works, it's not really enough on its own. Instead, you need something that makes the runner invest resources on runs that don't win them the game. And so this is why I'm always like, oh, assets and upgrades are actually key parts of core win conditions because they make the runner run. If you just are installing ice and more and more ice, often the runner can just click for four credits and end up actually beating you. Thinking back to my making running against Glacier list, a mistake that a lot of new players will make is they will just run against big ice willy-nilly. They'll spend four, five, six credits to see a single card out of HQ or R&D, which then means that the Glacier player can just put big ice on the remote and eventually the runner will not be able to break the critical piece of ice that stops them from scoring out. But against really good players, they will just say, there's no reason for me to run right now. I'll take four credits and pass, or probably do better than four credits and pass. And so um, as the corp, you need to compel them to run before they are completely set up and completely able to handle all of your things. Um, and then there's also, we, it goes back to this ice curve where like, oh, I want expensive taxing ice. Well, that usually means in the early game, you can only maybe res one or two pieces of ice across the first four or five turns. So that leaves all open a lot of aggressive runner strategies that can really punish it. And then if you say, oh, well, then what I'll do is I'll run cheap ice. Well, then in the late game, the runner breaks it for pennies. And so you end up having to balance this stuff and you use some ice that's mid-range, some ice that's cheap, and some ice that's high-end to kind of bridge through your whole game. But typically to really make that work, you want some upgrades or you want some assets that compel the runner to run on times that you control rather than that they decide. Um, so... We're finally going to get to like what I think about ice, and I was originally going to write a whole thing about this, but like I actually think Swabble's uh, quote was basically, I think, a, a beautiful encapsulation that ice and breakers are the net runner, what bread is who is sandwich. Fundamental, damn near essential, with substantial range in quality, desirability, and what they add to the experience, but rarely the point of the sandwich. So ice is not something you it's not the reason you should play a deck instead the reason should be something else it should be the id the assets the upgrades the agenda some synergy between all of those pieces very rarely am i going to buy a sandwich because the bread for the sandwich is amazing um and i think you know that it's very true for ice as well so to wrap up this video i actually want to talk about some i thought what i think is an interesting example of thinking about ice in um, a not too long ago meta. So I'm gonna look at Worlds 2020. Asa was by far and away the best deck, but which Asa was actually very up in the air. And there was three different Asa lists. There was actually probably four or five, but um, I'm just gonna focus on three of the ones that I know fairly well. Um, and we're gonna do a matching exercise. I'm gonna describe the decks. I'm gonna describe what they're non-ice packages look like and then show you what the three different ice packages look like and i'm going to encourage you to match them up and think about why they matched up the way they did so here are the three different packages uh deck number one is using you know has 21 assets nine agendas seven operations one upgrade a deck uh and it's key operations and i'm going to encourage you to if you don't know these cards to pause and quickly look them up. So the key one, you know, they all have Cybernetics Court, they all have Jeeves, they all have Rashida. And then things that look different are stuff like MC Austerity Policy, Mumbed Temple, Daily Quest, Lakshmi Smart Fabrics. Um, some of them, they're all running Biotic Labors, they're all running Fully Up, they're all running VLCs. Two of them are running Hedge Funds. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, only one of them is running Hedge Funds. Um, so, you know, this one on the left is going Daily Quests, MCA Policies, G's, Lakshmi, Maryland's. The one in the middle is going Cybernetics, Daily Quests, G's, Lakshmi, MCA's, and Rashida's. Um, only running 16 assets. And the one on the right is running DBS. It's running Reconstruction Contract and Dedication Ceremony and Tech Startups. So a very different look from the other three.
So think about these, think about what all the economy options look like for these different decks, and then we can go and look at, look at the ice. So common to all these decks is Hagen and Fairchild. Well, technically the last one doesn't have Fairchilds in it. Um, so we've got a list that's running two border controls, three Hawkins, three Fairchilds, three Gatekeepers, three Drafters, and then another one that's saying, well, it drops two Drafters for three Tour Guides, and it drops two Fairchilds. Um, and so, and then the last one is just saying it's two Hawkins, three Vidillas, three Gatekeepers, and three Drafters. And so each of these suites has some fundamental cores, right? They're all running Gatekeeper. They're all running some number of copies of Drafter. They're all running some number of Hawkins. So that there's some core ice that's just above the curve and in every list. But then they're swapping pieces in and out to fit different economic and different game flow needs. They also have different numbers. The deck on the left has... Um, uh, 14 pieces of ice, and then the other two decks have 11 pieces of ice. So once again, look at these pieces of ice, these different ice suites, these different kind of payloads, and you know you can, uh, and then try and match these things up. So I'll get, I will encourage you to pause the video for a second, think about how these match. You can also look them up on NRDB, but you know take a second to think about why these different cards would go in different places. Um, while you're thinking about it, I'm gonna go on a very quick tangent, ice count. People always ask, when I'm building my deck, how much ice should I put in? And the answer is, it's complicated. And I don't have a good answer for you in this video. I try to think about a good way to put one in, and there just isn't one. I will say, most ice, if they're not super asset focused and don't want and are not playing to protect those assets will run between 13 and 15 ice plus some defensive tricks so your mana garm uh skunk works your analytic voids your kaon bay grids if you're in startup like all those sorts of things asset decks will tend to have fewer than 13 15 pieces of ice glacier lists will tend to have a little bit more but um no one's really running what used to actually be somewhat common, which is like almost 20 pieces of ice. And why is this? Well, there's a couple of things. You actually only need about 11 ice in the list to have a 93% chance of seeing one or more ice after you mulligan. This means you can protect a turn one Rashida or a turn one asset or a turn one agenda. I mentioned Rashida, but don't show her because she's so fundamental to the game. If you don't know what Rashida Jaheem is because you're a startup player, Look her up. She's pretty wild. Um, that said, you're not too likely to see two ice after a mulligan. And the, but obviously, if you put more ice in, you're more likely to see two pieces of ice after a mulligan. And if you go back to really, I would, I'm going to say really old, by which I mean 2014, 15, 16 era Netrunner decks, there was more ice. And one of the reasons was because of how strong central pressure was. And in particular, how strong a card called a Count Siphon was. But in 2020, when all three of these Asa decks were being played, the only card that was being really played was Diversion of Funds, which is very ends up being quite different in terms of how much it punishes for a bunch of kind of boring, or maybe not boring, but nuanced reasons that I don't really want to sidetrack this whole video about. And so you could play decks that only drew one piece of ice on turn one, iced up a key asset, and then kept going. Asa also got to cheat because they could draw, see a seventh card, and then install their key uh, asset, which is usually Rashida, behind a piece of ice. And then if they drew their second ice within that, in their first seven cards, they could protect HQ because they have their ID ability, which lets them install, once per turn, install a second, or the first time each turn, rather, install a piece of ice uh, in or protect the, or install a card in or protect the remote. Okay, so let's go back through. So the um, first package ended up being the second, the first like wind condition package ended up being the second ice package. And this was uh, Chris Ferg's tablet Asa. And there's a bunch of things that you should think of like that should have been pointing to this. One, you could have counted the cards. But the other thing is like, well, this deck, this was a deck that had 21 assets and then had tour guide in it. So, which scaled with a number of resed assets. Um, it also, because it had one Fairchild, its ice was a little bit more expensive 
that are like still sort of the middle of the road ice. So it has two daily quests, three Mumbed temples, Marilyn's, and Rashida's as its primary econ. Um, so it can do, it wants a lot of cheapish early uh, ice that it then uses to kind of propel explosively into the game. It's not looking to drag the runner through a single remote. It's looking to just keep putting out one or two threats to make the runner run. And then at some point it's trying to get a combo out where it does biotic labor with a successful field test and build an enormous board that out tempos the runner and then propels that into winning. So the um, second package that was displayed, so the left side, was Pinsel Sandbox Asa, which won Worlds. Um, and so is probably the best Asa list that you could have played in, in 2020. Um, and this list, I mean, again, you could have counted it, and this one would have been very obvious because this has, this is the one that could actually fit um, 14 pieces of ice. But this is a more glaciary version. And one of the things it does is it says, oh, well, if I combine Fairchild and Border Control, that actually becomes very expensive because the runner has to break Border Control, break the Fairchild, then you pop the Border Control, and then they have to break the Fairchild a second time. And so it is built all basically all around MCA austerity um, behind a Fairchild. That's like what the deck was trying to do. And that was a very strong strategy. But this Econ, you'll notice, like this is the only deck of all three of the Ace lists that was running Hedge Fund because it needed a stronger economic foundation so that it could res this expensive ice earlier in the game. And so the very last uh, deck then by Process of Elimination was this Ban Vitruvius deck by Analyze Chris. It's also what I ran through basically all of 20 and 20. Well, this is a better version than what I ran, but this is uh, effectively what I was looking at. Um, and this was a combo list. It's trying to do Reconstruction Contract and Dedication Ceremony to score agendas out of hand. And particularly it can score a Vitruvius if you go Reconstruction Contract, Dedication Ceremony, Dedication Ceremony. And if you used a violet level clearance to install that reconstruction contract, you can also install a Project Vitruvius all in one turn. Score the Vitruvius, it gets three counters. That was a four card combo. So as long as you draw one other combo piece, and that's usually the red level clearance, you can just go again. Um, and so you would do that to score out seven points or often five points. You could often get two points just off the board through the normal course of play. And so this deck had much less econ Right? There's actually no Maryland campaigns in this list. It, all of its asset slots are basically dedicated to either comboing or uh, going fast. So Tech Startup is there to grab the reconstruction contracts from out of your deck. And so the ice then has to be even cheaper. So it loses all the fair child. It says, I can't spend six to, re to break, uh, to, to res a piece of ice. Hagen is like on the high end. So we cut down from three copies of Hagen uh, that are in the other two decks down to two and instead put in three vanillas so that we're just trying to force a barrier breaker out from the runner. And then it's just three gatekeepers and just three drafters. So this is a very different style of list. So when you're thinking about your decks and um, how you want to put ice in, you want to be thinking about sort of what does your econ package look like in the first three turns, the next six turns, and then past that to help think about the cost of the ice that you want to be putting in your deck um because the lower to the ground your econ is the start the cheaper your ice needs to be but that doesn't mean your ice is bad and this list by analyze chris was pilot to 10th at worlds uh it took me to uh six at intercontinent or at north american continentals like this wasn't a bad list even though it's running cheap low power ice uh and and tablets asa while it didn't do fantastic at worlds itself um won a major i want to say european continentals but uh, i might be slightly misremembering that so take home messages i want to encourage you when you're building your corp deck don't think about your ice first think about it middle or at the end of deck building it's not the primary way that most good corp decks for the last four or five years have won the game the ISIS attributes you should be looking at is their res cost and their strength. The subroutine text is like a second or third order uh, lever on its power. ICE will fill out different roles. It'll be gear check, it'll be taxing, it will punish face checks, or it will fill some tech hole in your deck. 
you need to fit ice to the economic curve of your deck. You can sometimes fit your econ to match your ice, but it's generally going to be better to play to a designed game plan and make the ice fit that rather than the other way around. And then I would encourage you to play with assets and upgrades. They give you active game text so that you could control how they fire, when they fire, what they do, instead of ice, which is primarily a passive defensive tool. Hope you enjoyed this video. I'm enjo I enjoyed making it, uh, and hopefully this gets me back on the course of making videos a little more frequently. So thanks for tuning in, and uh, you know, like and subscribe, all that YouTuber jazz, and have a nice day.